just introduce myself and then I'll tell you what we're going to do and you can tell me if there's anything else you'd rather do. So, um, <clears throat> so Stacy asked if I could sub for her, so I was very happy to do that. And um, for those of you who don't know me, I, what to say? Um, <laughs> So I've been I've been teaching at Common Ground for a while. I've been practicing for quite a while and practice in a lot of different traditions. And one of the things that I've been doing a lot of recently is um, teaching and practicing self-compassion. Some of you have been in the classes. I'm going to talk a little bit about that tonight. Um, mostly I'm going to talk about um, some of the things that I've noticed that might get in the way of our practicing compassion. So, or at least for me, and I'd be curious to see what your uh, responses are as well. And then we'll, we'll do some practice. All right, so um, let's start with a, we'll do a, a, a guided kind of grounding meditation, and then I'm gonna say a few things and then we'll practice some more. Does that sound okay? So I'm, I don't have the host function, so I'll just rely on you all to um, mute yourselves. I see you all are. And then when you want to um, say something, you can unmute. So let's start. I'll ring a bell. So let's start by directing our attention to the body. Feeling the weight of the body sitting or lying down if that's what you're doing. Feeling the contact with whatever you're sitting on. Feeling the contact of your feet or legs with the ground. And inviting the mind to rest to rest in the felt sense of the body. To rest in the support of the earth. To rest in the present moment. Inviting as best you can an acceptance or a willingness to be present with whatever is here in this moment. Noticing perhaps sensations that are pleasant, unpleasant, or neither. Seeing if you can just make space for all of it, however it is. Bringing an attitude of kindness and of curiosity.
This is how it is now. And if what you notice is tension or anxiety, contraction, resistance, inviting an attitude of kindness once again and compassion, perhaps even placing a hand or hands over your heart or elsewhere on your body, just offering yourself soothing touch Offering yourself compassion just for the way it is. And if you find the mind wandering off, thoughts of the past or the future, just noticing and bringing it back to this body, to this heart, to this mind, in this moment. And perhaps even sensing into the other beings in this space, in this practice space, these other beings who have taken some time on Friday night to come together to explore the practice, the heart practices, the opening of the heart. Sensing into those beings here, maybe appreciating the fact that others came, appreciating the fact that you came. So as much as is available, feeling that sense of connection and support. Breathing in and breathing out. So as I mentioned in the beginning, I wanted to offer a few reflections on um, the practice of compassion and specifically some of the things that I find get in the way of my um, being fully with the practice. And I, I intend this to be interactive, so I'm not claiming to have the word here. I'm really um, looking for some uh, discussion, if you're willing, about your 
experiences. So I think it was the venerable Analio, if you know Analio, I know Jessica does. Uh, the venerable Analio is a is a uh, German-born monk, um, ordained in Sri Lanka, uh, who now resides at uh, the Barry Center for Buddhist Studies, and he is. Uh, I like to think it was kind of the rock star of this tradition. He's very well loved and very erudite and has an enormous heart. And um, he's actually, I think he's on a year long retreat right now in his little place there at Barry Center. And uh, I thought I, one of the things I appreciate about Analio is he's so um, honest about his own practice. He talks a lot about how he had so much difficulty practicing metta or loving kindness, like he just couldn't do it until he connected with the animal world and saw uh, animals playing outside his kuti or wherever he was. And it was that that allowed him to open his heart. So I just appreciate the fact that somebody with that level of practice is willing to share that. But what, one of the things that Analio said, and I think it's he who said this, was that most of us have a, a special affinity or a connection with one or more of the Brahma Viharas. I'm guessing that everyone here knows what the Brahma Viharas are, or you wouldn't be here. Does anyone not know what that term means? It's okay if you don't. Okay, all right. So I'll just say a couple of words about that. So. Brahma Vihara, that's a big word. Brahma meaning God or divine. Vihara is a place. So it's actually the, the, the abode of the gods is one way to translate it. But it, it is the qualities of the awakened heart mind, the heart qualities of a Buddha or of all of us, really. Um, and they include, the first one is metta, or loving kindness, um, also translated as friendliness or just a, a, a wish for others' well being and our own. The second one is compassion or what's called karuna in Pali. The third one is mudita or it's called appreciative or sympathetic joy. And the fourth one is equanimity. So these are, uh, they're all interrelated, and they're, they're all qualities that are actually available to all of us. And they have practices that help us to, to connect with those and cultivate them in ourselves. So it's said that there are two wings of the Buddhist practice. One are wisdom practices, such as meditation that provides insight into what's going on in our own minds and in the world. And uh, these heart practices, the Brahma Viharas, and the two support one another. So wisdom without compassion can be thought of, can be cruel sometimes, and compassion without wisdom can be stupid, is the word sometimes used. It's it's not not necessarily helpful. So the two are intertwined, and those are the Brahma Viharas. So. Um, the practice usually starts with the practice of loving kindness or metta. So we we cultivate uh, a, a, a an aspiration or an intention for the well-being of other beings, and then when we meet the suffering of other beings, that becomes compassion. So we feel compassion. So we have a so this kind of sense of caring, and then we see someone whose suffering and compassion arises on us. And that's a natural thing that happens. And there are ways that we can practice to support that. I'll give an example. So, wow, yesterday I was at, uh, uh, I was at the dollar store in Midway. I was looking for things for my, um, my daughter-in-law who's an elementary school teacher in Minneapolis where they don't have any supplies. So she needed these, things so she could do this project with them. And I said I would go get them. And the only place I knew where to get like pipe cleaners was the dollar store. And I was feeling pretty open hearted. I had kind of a caring thing. 
going on and I went there and outside the dollar store, if you've not been there, you should go because you'll see how many people in St. Paul live. And there was a man going through this very dirty garbage bin, pulling things out and looking for things, I assume to sell or to eat. And it just broke my heart open. I felt so much compassion for him. So that that was the example of a, of a heart that's open. For some reason, my heart was open in that moment, seeing the suffering of another being and, and feeling compassion. And it's a natural thing that happens in all of us. So for whatever reason, um, compassion seems to be the, the of those for practices, compassion is the one that I am most drawn to. And so Analio suggests that whatever resonates the most with us initially is the place that we should start. So paradoxically, it's both my favorite one, but it's also the one that most easily throws me off balance. So I saw that gentleman going through the garbage can last night and I was filled with compassion. And then that's all I thought of ever since. I mean, even now thinking about it is it's almost overwhelming. So it has that flavor for me as well. So it feels like what opens my heart can also overwhelm me. Does anybody have that experience as well? Where they see things that it's just, yeah, okay. So the practices and there are like formal practices that are associated with these different qualities are said to help with um with uh, manage is not the word i want but helps to help us to be with what is there and not be so overwhelmed and uh the practice of equanimity specifically is what helps with that. Um, and the traditional antidote actually for the, the sense of overwhelm or despair when we're practicing compassion is the practice of appreciative joy. So this is a lot of words. So, um, so appreciative joy was the third of the Brahma Vihara. So appreciative joy means enjoying someone else's good fortune. Um, Carolyn Jones, who's a Dharma teacher, she, she talks about this mudita, or this appreciative joy as being the love that celebrates. So we're celebrating somebody else's joy, which I kind of like. And the easiest way for me to experience that is when my granddaughter who's she's five years old and she loves to have what she calls dance parties and she loves the music from Disney movies. All those Disney songs sound the same to me, but she she doesn't care. She loves them. And so she wants somebody to put on the music from Frozen and then she just like throws herself around the living room. It's really hard to be overwhelmed by another suffering when a child is like dancing around the room. So. So that is when I can really understand how appreciative joy or enjoying somebody else's joy can really help to modulate that sense of overwhelm with compassion. But unfortunately, she's not around all the time. She wasn't there last night when I saw this gentleman looking through the garbage. So at other times, I find it more difficult to stay equanimous in the face of things like that. And I'm sure that if I practiced more, um, then maybe it would be easier. Um, but I'm also sure, I've become increasingly sure, that there are a few things that contribute to my sense of despair or overwhelm. And it helps me to be able to name those. And maybe you, you have experience of these too. So I'm going to just talk about a couple of them. And I, I'm really curious to see if any of this resonates with you. So again, I'm talking about the things that I've discovered that I think um, make it difficult for me to practice compassion in the, in the face of someone else's suffering. 
by which I mean I, I'm easily overwhelmed. So the, the first one that I want to talk about is something that I'm call, that I call the empathy trap. So those who study things like this, psychologists, psychiatrists, um, neurologists or neuroscientists and meditators, they write a lot about the difference between empathy and compassion. Has anybody heard about that? Raise your hand if you know about that. Okay. I think it's really interesting and it helps me a lot. So they, they say that empathy, when we feel empathy, it's an, it's an automatic, involuntary, biologically built in reaction to the suffering of others. So this is something that we, in a way, have no control over. When we see another being suffering, uh, that could be an animal being or you know, a dog or something, or it could be a human being or whatever, another being, we, we naturally feel empathy. And that comes from the emotional part of our brain, right? We, we, we can relate to that, that's empathy. Compassion, on the other hand, is a predominantly cognitive process. And it, it happens in the prefrontal cortex, the, part, the thinking brain. That's actually also the part of the brain that's engaged when we're practicing mindfulness. And compassion, so compassion is, is in the thinking part of the brain. And it's in the part of the brain that's associated with expressing and enacting aspiration or intention. So I think that's fascinating. So we see somebody suffering. I saw this gentleman looking through the garbage can and immediately the emotional part of my brain, the empathic part of my brain was activated. And because I wasn't very mindful at the time, I and I was not intentionally trying to connect to my aspiration that he be free from suffering. I mean, I felt that, but it wasn't real intentional. I, I kind of stayed in that empathic part of my brain and I got increasingly overwhelmed. But had I been able to take a moment, maybe take a breath, connect to my body, you know, feel my feet on the ground, connect to my intention that he and all beings be free from suffering, I might not have gotten so swept away in the moment, I'm guessing. I might have been able to go into my higher level thinking and modulate that, that feeling of overwhelm. I, I, I want to make this as an experiment for myself the next time this happens. So, um, so I'm thinking that being able to connect to our aspiration or an intention that others be free from suffering provides kind of a protection. So we talk about, um, in Buddhism, we talk about taking refuge. And this is, for me, it's a refuge to be able to connect to my intention that others be free from suffering. Because when we do that, then we're in this higher level brain functioning and we're less likely to be overwhelmed and we're more likely to be able to respond in a way that's helpful. So I'm going to pause for a minute. This is a lot of talking. Does that um, make sense to you? Do you have questions? Have you experienced this empathic overwhelm yourself? Anybody? Yeah. I, I love that you're bringing this up because um, I am fairly sensitive to other people's emotions and what's going on. And to really understand like, I've always thought having empathy is a really important thing, and it is. But I also know there are times when I get really overwhelmed by my emotions. <laughs> and to know that it's coming from two different parts of our brain is really fascinating to me. And um, that this practice has really been helping me not get too lost. Like when grief comes up, feel that grief and know that it's going to pass. But it's probably that knowing too, knowing that this is going to be past that's connecting with the prefrontal part of the brain. I love it. Absolutely. You are knowing it. And the knowing it is the cortex, right? The prefrontal cortex. It's actually Richie Davidson, the University of Wisconsin, that's done a lot of this work. 
So yeah, so isn't that cool? I mean, the Buddha was a genius, right? <laughs> he didn't have a, a FR, fMRI, but he, he knew this. It's the knowing of it that allows us to not be engulfed. Yeah. Anybody else? Could anybody else relate to this? Yeah, Jessica? Yeah. Yeah, I definitely t tend toward the being like more empathetic, empathetic and you know there's something about like you know it makes sense the sort of the neural structures though because like it's almost like the the mirror neurons that we have that, that you know have that empathy and like i mean there's survival kind of things you know what what's right. what's out there what does it feel like on me so i know if i could go over there and help them and i think but um but, and i think that um one of the things that's been cool is that i've done some work with um roshi Hel joan halifax and um in uh in, in santa fe working on the cultivating compassion you know like the compassion is not just a sort of inert thing that you either have or don't or whatever but it's something that can be cultivated and and sort of purposefully sort of utilized and i thought that was kind of a neat concept too that i hadn't really thought of before yeah that's cool thank you yeah so the practices in the practices we're cultivating it we're making it more likely that we're going to use if you want to put it neurologically these higher brain functions and not get caught in that screaming amygdala yeah yeah anyone is there anything else anybody wants to add before we move on yeah i see your hand there yeah i can't hear you you're muted oh there we go yeah um, thank you i do you i'm curious if you have anything to say about how that distinction you're making um relates to i don't know like when you talk about like overwhelm where i would relate most to that is just like having to define your own boundaries as far as you know where you're going to step in and try to be you know actively compassionate or helpful and where you're you know drawing lines around where you're choosing to you know how far you're choosing to go and trying to be helpful to someone who you've I guess that's where I would feel that the most when you know you have an opportunity to be helpful or at least to engage in some way but you may want or need to you know um, choose a point where you're you're going to stop Absolutely. That's a, think, a thinking function, right? We, we're discerning where we want to set boundaries, what we're able to do and not do. It's difficult to make those decisions when you're in that state of overwhelm. So again, it, it's, it doesn't mean that we just throw all our resources and everything else at the, at the problem, but we discern what we're able to do, what's going to be helpful, whatever. And we can only do that when we're mindful. Yeah. Thank you. So um, I'll just mention a couple of other things that I've been reflecting on that for me, anyways, get in the way of my um, practicing compassion for others. And um, the second one is leaving myself out of this equation, leaving myself out of the equation of compassion. So um, I think it's not a mistake, of course, that the instructions for practicing metta or loving kindness that are provided in the, the Sudhi Maga, which is a text, they start with practicing kindness towards ourselves. The Metta Sutta repeats the phrase, may all beings be at ease. It, said, it includes that twice. And it doesn't say, may all beings except me be at ease. It says all beings without exception, without exception. But it wasn't until I started practicing and studying mindful self-compassion that I really got in touch, that I knew the level of my resistance to offering kindness and compassion to myself. And those of you who have 
practice mindful self-compassion with with Jane and myself and others who've been teaching this now for a long time um, know that this is this is a common phenomenon at least in this culture so it's said 77 percent of Americans find it easier to feel compassion for others than for themselves so if you're one of them you're in good company but that that it, we we really need to start with ourselves so that we have a reservoir that we can offer to others and there's you know there's lots of reasons for why we don't want to offer it to ourselves cultural conditioning family of origin stuff other causes and conditions and it's worth bringing awareness to them so that we can examine them and discard those that would seem to exclude us from the rest of humanity and make us undeserving of compassion or kindness or whatever it is so for me, this is at the very heart of what the Buddha taught. So we offer ourselves compassion, not to make ourselves, our egos feel better, but so that we can connect to the love and compassion that's much greater than the stories we tell ourselves. It also, when we offer ourselves compassion, it helps our nervous systems relax so that we can remember who we really are. Like, oh, okay, I'm a, a worthy, human being like everyone else and I have this heart mind and I have something that I can offer to others we offer ourselves compassion so that we can extend it to all other beings with no one left behind as the Buddha said in that phrase without exception so just take a moment and let that sit um, so again, I'm just offering what I've discerned as some of the things that stand in my way of cultivating compassion. And for me, this leaving myself out of the equation is a huge one. I don't, I don't have a big enough reservoir sometimes. Um, yeah, so yeah, Jessica's saying the ability to be with my own pain seems to be in direct proportion to my ability to show up in a useful, I didn't see the rest of it. Uh, uh, in a useful, non-pitying, non-fixing, or controlling being with the pain of others. Yeah, that's my that's my experience for sure. So instead of being selfish or whatever other things we tell ourselves, it's actually a, a requisite for compassion practice. So I'm gonna take a, take a a moment here uh, to um, invite you, if you're willing to just offer yourself a little compassion right now on the spot. <laughs> uh, so if you want to put a hand or hands over your heart, you, I would invite you to do that and just see if you can notice what effect that has on your body mind right now as you do that. With as much mindfulness as you can muster, really focus on the felt sense of your hands on your heart, the weight of them, the warmth if they're warm. Just appreciating offering yourself some kindness. And then if you're really brave, you could give yourself a hug. This is one of my favorite practices. This is, can feel kind of weird if you're not used to it. If you're not okay with this in public, then that's fine. But just give yourself a little hug. The way you might hug somebody whom you love. And just notice what that feels like. And nobody's looking. <laughs> so that's one of the, for those who have taken mindful self-compassion, they, they know this, but that's one of the basic practices of self-compassion and what it does physiologically is to relax the nervous system it relaxes the sympathetic nervous system and engages the parasympathetic nervous system the rest and digest system so that we can be available to ourselves and others and it's very simple i guarantee you in my experience it will have a positive effect if you practice it and then your heart is available for others any questions, comments, 
Oh, Jessica's doing a practice. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Or even like, like you ever do this to a dog, you know, you can do it for yourself. <laughs> Just giving yourself a little head massage. I remember when I was on a retreat with Analia, so here's like a senior level, like incredible practitioner. He says he always starts his meditation by rubbing his head. So I take that to be an endorsement of this. Anything anybody wants to add or comment or object to what I just said recently? I'm sorry, I was on a little bit later. But it's okay. This is beautiful what you're talking about is so helpful um and i i find it's it sounds funny but i have this little, little stuffed lamb little you can put it in in the microwave and it warms up and it's a little lamb it's so sweet and so at night it's really something but i find if i put it on my chest on, on my heart area it's so comforting mm -hmm. and and that helps me understand why you know yeah. Just that that um, that comforting, you yeah. know. Well, thank you for that. I mean, yeah, you're and I could feel with my hand how much yeah. it's so nice. It feels so good. Yeah, yeah. yeah keep it up. Good for you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. 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 Um, okay, I'm going to mention and then one other thing um, that those of you who have heard me before have heard me talk about, but I think it's a fascinating and for me a really important aspect of our own suffering. And this is the idea of moral injury. Raise your hand if you know about moral injury. Anybody heard of the term moral injury? No? Okay. So, um, the concept of moral injury has historically been applied to the experience of soldiers in battle. So soldiers who engaged in behaviors or watched others engage in them that were in opposition to their deepest values. So there are a lot of soldiers who come back from combat who have experienced these injuries. But more recently, and this is really interesting to me, this term has been applied to the injury that all of us experience as a result of being exposed to or engaging in behaviors that are destroying the planet, oppressing large groups of people, uh, injuring children and other innocent people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So just think of the last few years, right? what we've all been exposed to and what that does to our heart minds. Because at least in a lot of those things, we are all complicit in some way or another. It is very hard not to be complicit in climate change unless you live in a hut in the wherever. I mean, we, we're, all, we're all contributing in ways big and small. So Sally Weintraub, she's a psychologist in Great Britain she argues that we are living in what she calls the culture of uncare, which recruits our participation in an immoral project that encourages and sometimes requires us to live in a way that causes huge environmental and social damage. It encourages an uncaring mindset that sees the world as our oyster, something to be exploited, and practices outsourcing the damage to the poor. And boy, are we seeing that. I mean, we're just, yeah. I mean, you could probably think of 10 examples in the last week. So both of these strategies are designed to distance us, to protect us from experiencing the traumatic shock of moral injury. So we are, we be, those of us who are privileged live in these worlds in which we, by design, are distanced from the effect of what we're doing and what others are doing. So, you know, we might be numbing ourselves with Netflix or the internet or whatever else we choose. While these injuries, I mean, we're absorbing this. They're, they're in there and they're festering, but we're unaware of them. So when we wake up, when we're mindful, when we notice what's going on, 
we have more agency, we have more ability to respond to what's happening in ways that are helpful. But again, paradoxically, this waking up can also be very painful because we see the ways that we're complicit. And so when that happens, this, this means that the practice of self-compassion becomes even more important. You know, it would be so easy, I find it so easy, when I am really aware of the fact that I am contributing to so much of the destruction of the planet. Again, for me to fall into overwhelm, despair, not wanting to do anything, um, self-flagellation, whatever. And then I, I'm not able to act in compassionate ways and kind ways towards others that are suffering as a result of this. Uh, so in those instances, it is even more important to A, acknowledge the fact that we are all morally injured, including ourselves, and to offer ourselves compassion first so that we're able to offer it to others. And I could say more about this, but I won't in the interest of time because I want us to be able to practice. So, so those are three things that have just kind of came to me as I was thinking about what I could do tonight that are things that, um, that I understand to be um, contributors sometimes to my difficulty in uh, cultivating compassion in the way that I would like. And, and as someone said, Jenny said, I think the knowing of it is what allows to the freedom from it. When I can know it, then I can respond in ways that are um, helpful. When I'm unaware of it or don't know it, then I'm pretty much trapped. So that's what I got to say, which seems like a lot. <laughs> uh, sorry if it was too many words. Um, so I, I would love for us to practice. And I've got a guided practice that we can do that's related to this. But before we do that, I just would love to hear um, if you've got anything else that you would like to add, um, argue with, whatever, I would love to hear it. Anybody? Oh, here comes somebody. Thank you, Jean. Yeah. Can I, you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, the moral injury sounds like um, like I really, really heard it when you talked about the um, soldiers or people who experience war, but then kind of like the range to like, all the way to like numbing out on Netflix. I would consider like the numbing, like kind of a, uh, I don't know if I'd call it a moral injury, but like a strategy. Yeah, I didn't mean it. I, I, if you understood it that way, that was my mistake. I didn't mean it as a moral injury. I meant it as a strategy. It's one of the things that the culture of uncare encourages, perhaps. Yeah, as a strategy to not be aware of the moral injuries. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that. You're welcome. Yeah. Did that? Did the idea resonate with you of moral injury? Yeah, um, especially when like, you know, wisdom can arise and really see clearly the strategies maybe that like worked at some time in the past, but are no longer working. And it can feel like um, messy, like, uh, I don't want to do that. I don't want to go back to binge watching Netflix because uh, you know, it just, it's not working. It's just feeding delusion. And um, something earlier said about like sometimes wisdom without compassion can just be, uh, I don't remember exactly what you said, but some like just mean or shut down kind of cold hearted. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing how wisdom can really get in there and, and you know, see clearly all the strategies. And then it's just like, this is an un uncomfortable feeling. It's almost like a little nudge of like, okay, enough suffering, like maybe a little self-compassion there. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Listen. yeah, thank you. 
I've seen some, uh, a lot of, I, I, I've been impressed with a lot of programming that I have viewed on things like Netflix that um, feels like very high quality storytelling, which at its best can, I think, sometimes deepen our, our compassion or our empathy as well. Yeah. So that's the flip side of that. <laughs> Yeah, point well taken. Yes. I like I've definitely had things sort of brewing in the back of my soul while I'm watching something at times where, you know, there's part of me that that it, it, it causes me to reflect on things in a new way or um and I, I appreciate when a program is able to do that. Yeah. Thank thank you. Thank you. I think for me anyways, it always comes back to intention. Is the intention to numb out? Or is the intention maybe to learn something that's important or to open our hearts in some way? So um, to be aware of why it is we're doing what we're doing is seems like an important component for me anyways. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? I, um, I've found that during the worst times of COVID and and all the stuff that has been going on the last few years, I would specifically watch an, a half hour to an hour of a comedy, of a lighthearted, kind comedy every day just to lift me up a little bit. Because there, there were some tough times there. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, sometimes I feel, I, you know, sometimes when I think about what's happening with with this earth um, that can be really overwhelming that can just hit me like a ton of bricks and um i don't know how to i mean there are times when i when i do go into sort of a mode where i'm not thinking about it and i'm doing i'm doing other things that are distracting from it but then but then it it you know something happens and it hits me again like a ton of bricks and it's it's very easy to just sort of to to remove myself from that realization of what we're doing to this planet mm -hmm. um to sort of let that just that's over there and i'm you know it, it'll come back but it's over there and i just sort of put it over there for a time and i don't know how to i mean it's 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 not healthy. I mean, the whole thing isn't healthy, but I don't know how to live with that all the time, with that realization all the time. Um, yeah, that would be really tough. I think that's a very um, important point, that, that taking a break is also an act of self-compassion. And, and it's wisdom, again, that allows us to discern when it is too much, and when you need to take a break, I loved your story about watching, was it watching something funny every day during the pandemic? Again, that's a nervous system reset, if you want to put it that way. We, we need to give ourselves a break sometimes. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. So shall we practice? Oh, Suzanne, yes. Well, I just briefly, I was going to say um, tonight, the reason I was a little late is um, I was out walking at this old Cedar Avenue bridge. I live in Bloomington and it was so beautiful in the woods, um, seeing the changes of fall and it was just so calming. So during COVID, how I've been dealing with things um, is by getting outside and walking. It, it's, it just really just calms me down. Like nature is, is there and it's a constant or it's it's changing, but um, I also always get messages um, from nature. Uh, tonight it was just the changes of the season and and how life changes and you know there's it's it's all part of the process you know dying and new life and just just that sense of oneness. Um, with nature and life mm -hmm. so that it kind of helped me tonight anyway thanks yeah, yeah you're, you're touching into the the, th the the three teachings of impermanence and uh, 
unsatisfactoriness. I don't. I'm not sure that was there, but yeah, yeah. I mean, the Buddha awakened under a tree, and his recommendation was that that was where the monastics were to go to. So yeah, go back to that idea of how intention is so important and can be a refuge, because that seems. For me, anyways, that seems to have been key to all of this. Um, so I'm going to guide us through a, a meditation that um, touches into that a bit. And um, so we'll do that for a while, and then it'll be time to end. So uh, I would invite you to find whatever is a comfortable posture for yourself, lying down, sitting, whatever allows you to relax as best as possible. If you want to turn off your video, you can. It would be great if you would turn on, on again when we're uh, ready to end so we can see one another. But in the meantime, do whatever works for you. So settling into a comfortable posture. And bringing your attention once again to the felt sense of the body. This body that is always in the present moment. Arriving. Feeling the weight of the body sitting or lying down and the contact with whatever you're resting on. Relaxing as best you're able into the felt sense of the body. And the support of the earth underneath. Arriving right here and right now. And now letting the felt sense of the body move into the background of your awareness and bringing into the foreground the breath. Feeling the breath coming into the body and the breath leaving the body. Experiencing the inhalation and the exhalation the movement of the breath. One breath at a time. Inviting the body to be soothed by the rhythm of the breath. This breath that was with us from the moment we were born and will be with us to our last breath. So resting the mind on the movement of the breath.
I'm not needing to fix it or change it, make it be any different than it is. Just this breath in this moment. And now when you're ready from this place of groundedness in the body and the breath, turning your attention to the ground of intention, to the refuge of intention, aligning with, connecting with your deepest values. What guides your life on what do you stand? Perhaps it's love, kindness, the first of the Brahma Viharas. Compassion. Justice. Perhaps it's aligning with what the Buddha called right intention. Renunciation or restraint. Loving kindness. Non-harming. not needing to pick the right one or only one, and just seeing what arises in the mind when you align with your deepest values. It is from this place that I respond And noticing what it feels like in the body when you connect, when you ground in these intentions. Perhaps noticing a sense of solidity, weightiness, or something else. Taking a moment to rest back and savor the felt sense of aligning with your values. And letting that infuse your being. Feeling into the wholesome qualities that are the bedrock of your life. And as you do so, acknowledging that there may have been times when internal obstacles have made it difficult to connect to these values. Times perhaps when self-limiting thoughts or other habit patterns have distracted you from responding to the suffering of others in alignment with your values. Times when you might have felt awkward speaking up or fear of failure or scorn or even harm Times when you doubted your own abilities. So just acknowledging any internal obstacles if they come to mind. 
and offering yourself words of kindness for the pain of having been caught in old patterns, caught in a small sense of self, May I accept my limitations with compassion. Of being a perfectly imperfect human being. And in the future, may I respond to the best of my ability and hold myself with kindness when I fall short. And calling to mind also the times when external obstacles have stood in the way of living from your deepest values. Times when the culture of uncare has made it difficult, if not impossible, to live a life of conscience, to live a life of compassion. Times when external circumstances and systems have prevented you from responding in the ways you aspire to. Times when it has been difficult to live a life aligned with your values. So taking a moment to feel the pain of not being able to live in the way you most deeply desire because of external circumstances. This is what it means to be human, to know the difference between what leads to suffering and what leads to non-suffering, and to not always be able to do what is right. All of us suffer in this way. All of us live with broken hearts. Perhaps sensing the presence of everyone here tonight, each of us trying to do our best to align, to live with our deepest values and from our deepest values. each of us experiencing the pain of not always being able to do so. So taking a moment now to breathe in a word or two of compassion for yourself, whatever that might be, an aspiration, Perhaps may I accept myself as I am. May I offer myself kindness, whatever comes to mind, breathing in a wish for yourself. And calling to mind once again those in on this call tonight, those who came to study and practice and share together. Breathing in that aspiration for yourself and breathing out to the others here tonight an aspiration for their well being, for their compassion, for their kindness. 
breathing in something for yourself, breathing out to the others here tonight. Now calling to mind other beings beyond this practice group, maybe beings whom you know or beings whom you don't know. Including all the beings in this world who are living these lives of imperfection. who are doing the best they can according to what they understand. Beings everywhere, breathing in a wish for yourself, perhaps the wish that you be free from suffering and know the causes of suffering and breathing out to beings everywhere that they may be free from suffering and know the causes of suffering. Breathing in for yourself and breathing out to all beings. May we all be free from suffering May we all know peace. So that's one take on practicing compassion for self and others. There are many other ways to do it. Some people are visual people. They like to have images in their minds. Some like words. Some just like to work with the felt sense. It's all good. It's important to find what resonates with you.